Hello everyone, welcome to session 6 of LTEC 654 Programming Games and Simulations. In this week's overview video, I want to talk about three things. First up, Programming Assignment 2. As you all know, this assignment was focused on learning how to create a new Godot script, associating that script with a project scene, and then writing some code to control the nodes in that scene. And specifically, we focused on how to instantiate a copy of an existing scene that we had stored in our resource library. For the most part, all of you were successful in this. And depending on your level of experience, it took different levels of effort to get to some sort of success. But I have to say, overall, I love the effort and creativity on display. I could feel your excitement in being able to finally design something and quote unquote play it in Godot. The creativity was immense. We had cats, unicorns and dragons, geometric shapes and sparkling hearts, and lots of food from watermelon to sushi. I have to give a shout out to Becca who created arguably the funniest don't be a square design with her banana jamma. Thank you, Becca. That was great. So let's talk about some of the discoveries that were made in this week's assignment. A lot of you focused on how this assignment helped you understand how to position nodes using Godot's coordinate system. And that was one of the main points of the assignment, understanding the X and Y positions of anything that we add to the scene tree. Being able to control the location of objects through code is critical to programming games and simulations. Another area of discovery was recognizing the value of having organized code. Many of you spoke about the importance of using meaningful variable names. As your projects grew in size, it was hard to keep track of what copy of the animated sprite you were referring to in your code. And so many of you started using variable names that had meaning as a strategy for managing that ever-growing complexity. The third point that came up was the fundamental idea that we can use GDScript to modify the properties of nodes. Of course, that was the whole point of the assignment. We can use code to manipulate a whole range of properties from scale to frame to position. And several of you made the connection that if a property is present in the inspector panel, that means you can adjust it in GDScript. For example, if you have an animated sprite selected in the 2D workspace, you will see all of the properties of that animated sprite shown on the right in the inspector panel. Things like frame, speed, scale, playing, centered, so on and so forth. All of those properties can be adjusted using the inspector panel's graphical user interface and its sliders and checkboxes and numbers, or they can be adjusted through GDScript. They're all the same properties, there's just two ways to adjust them. The more powerful of which, and the more dynamic, of course, is through code. Now, a couple of other things I want to point out. First, several of you were expecting the origin of your instantiated sprites to be at the top left corner of the node, as opposed to the center of the node. If you take a look at these two pictures, you'll see what I mean. On the left, we have the animated circle positioned right in the center of the viewport. It has an X position of 512 and a Y position of 325. By default, Godot centers its visual nodes so that their origins are at the center of the asset. In this case, the circle graphic from Piskel. Now let's compare that to the picture on the right. This shows an animated sprite with the same X and Y position, but its origin is the upper left-hand corner. Either approach works, and please note that you can adjust this through the inspector panel by checking or unchecking the centered box. You can also adjust this through code by setting the centered property to true or false. Here's what that would look like in code. You can see I have two animated sprites that have been added to the scene tree. First, the code for the red one. Notice line 9, which sets the centered property of red circle to be true. Now the code for the yellow circle, on the other hand, in line 17, we can see its centered property is set to false. 
And thus we can see in the output when we play our game that the red and yellow circle, even though they have the same X and Y position, are showing up at slightly different positions. Now, I don't want to get too in the weeds on this, but hopefully this gives you a little more insight into how to control the position of nodes that you add to the scene tree. Next up, I want to compliment you folks on all the creative ways you came up with to negotiate and sort out the X and Y positions of your squares in the Don't Be a Square assignment. Some of you try to think about your creations in terms of grids, creating very systematic approaches. A good example is Hannah's heart. She determined the position of the center column and then added or subtracted 50 pixels each time to come up with the X and Y values for all the other squares. Others of you, like Sandy, turn to external tools such as spreadsheets to calculate out specific X and Y values ahead of time. Others with a bit more experience found ways to make Godot calculate the positions dynamically. These are all great examples of the kinds of problem-solving skills that can make programming challenging and a rewarding intellectual endeavor. Soon, we'll be learning about some of the built-in tools Godot comes with that can help us organize lots of nodes. These are referred to as container nodes in Godot, such as the H-box for horizontal box, a V-box for vertical box, and a grid node. These are simply containers designed to make laying out other visual nodes easier to manage. But we'll talk about that later on. Finally, another interesting topic came up in the form of Ronald's Meow Meow design. What was clever about this design was his use of depth, or how he layered different nodes on top of each other to create a certain visual effect. If we zoom in on the cat's ear, we can see that he layered three nodes on top of each other to create the illusion of an inner and outer ear. So let's walk through how he might have approached this design. First, he rotated one of his squares and then added it to the scene tree, writing something like add child square one. Then he created another instance of his square, scaled it down, rotated it, and then placed it on top of the first one. This was possible because he added it to the scene tree after square one. Thus, square two sits on top of square one. And finally, he added yet another square without rotation to cover up the other two. And again, since this was added as the third node, it was on top of the other two nodes and covered them up. This was a great example of an important concept in Godot. The fact that the order in which you add children to the scene tree matters because of how they can potentially overlap. Okay, let's move on. Next up, I want to share a few tips and tricks for working with the Godot engine. First up, I want you to know that you can actually adjust the size of the code font used in the editor. To do this, you need to go to Editor Settings. From there, under the Interface dropdown, you will find that you can adjust the code font size. By default, it is pretty small. So feel free to adjust this to something that is more comfortable for you in your setup. Tip number two. This has to do with organizing the resources in your resource library using subfolders. So far, our projects have been really small, so this hasn't been much of an issue. However, as they get larger in size, I want to encourage you to keep your resources library organized by putting things into subfolders. You can do this by simply right-clicking and selecting New Folder. A common setup for game projects is to create a subfolder called Assets, and then within that folder, add additional subfolders for images, sounds, and fonts. Now, it's important to note that the names of these folders are case-sensitive, so Assets with a capital A is different than Assets with a lowercase a. This brings us to tip number three. If you start changing the folder structure of the resource library, I want you to recognize that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the structure of that library in Godot and your Godot project folder saved somewhere on your computer. That's not an accident. Those are actually the same things. It's just a different view or window into the contents of that common directory. Tip number four, once you start getting lots of subfolders, the path names to objects in those subfolders can be quite long. So a handy trick is to use a drag and drop strategy to reference the path of those resources. 
So as you can see here, if my animated sprite scene is nested into a couple of subfolders and I need to load that resource, I can easily just drag and drop it into my code and the Godot engine will automatically populate the path to that resource in the code for me. In other words, I don't have to type it out. So this is helpful for anyone like me who is prone to making easy typos. And finally, one thing that we haven't talked about and I probably should have introduced earlier is the ability to add guidelines to your project to help you line up visual assets. Just like other design software, Godot allows you to add horizontal and vertical guides to the 2D workspace. The way you do that is to come all the way over to the vertical or horizontal rulers, click and hold for a split second, and voila, you'll see a purple guideline pop up. With that guideline, you can slide it over the workspace and drop it wherever you want it to be. If you look carefully while you're dragging it, Godot is telling you exactly what pixel you're on so you can get it exactly where you need it to be. Okay, in the last minute, I just want to talk about this week's programming tutorials. This week, we're going to talk about how to add interactivity to our projects. And we're going to do this by using buttons and something called signals. You can think of signals as the lines of communication between all of the objects in your games. In addition, we're also going to learn how to remove nodes from the scene tree. Last week was all about adding nodes to the scene tree, so now we need to study how to remove those nodes when we don't want to see them anymore. Okay, everyone, that's all for this video. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.